Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to today's talk in the series on uh, health reform and the ACA. Um, today's talk is co-sponsored uh, by the McLean Center uh, along with the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago and I'm so pleased uh, that uh, Steve Edwards, the Deputy Director of the Institute, is with us today um, for, for, to hear our speaker. Uh, our speaker, as you know, is Commissioner Bashara Shuker. Uh, since 2009, uh, when Dr. Shuker was recruited by Mayor Richard M. Daley, uh, he has served as the Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. Commissioner Shuker oversees one of the country's largest and most complex health agencies, an agency that serves almost three million people. In 2011, Commissioner Shuker and Mayor Emanuel launched Healthy Chicago. This was the city's first comprehensive public health agenda. Commissioner Shuker has worked to secure more than $60 million in new funding for a broad range of programs, including initiatives to prevent obesity, tobacco use, teen pregnancy, and also to conduct comparative effectiveness research. Commissioner Shuker has served as Vice Chair of Community Medicine in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. In this capacity, uh, he created the Chicago Community Engagement Program, which mentors students who are interested in developing local and global community engagement projects that focus on education and community service. Commissioner Shuker received his MD from American University in Beirut in 1997, completed his family medicine residency at Baylor, and received his master's degree in healthcare management from the University of Texas in 2009. Today, Commissioner Shuker will be speaking on Healthy Chicago, this new initiative, and the Affordable Care Act. Please join me giving a warm welcome to Commissioner Shuker. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Um, um, my name is Bashara Shukir, and I figured for the next hour or so, we'll cover a little bit about the implication of the Affordable Care Act on um, local government. Uh, for the video recorder, I'm more of a walker, so I'm going to keep you busy for the next, uh, next hour. And I just realized that usually when I go to speak, I usually have one microphone, and here I have two. So uh, note to self, next time I'm speaking at the University of Chicago, no slim fit suits. You just need to wear a uh, good old regular, uh, regular suit. So, you know, back in 2011, when, when Mayor Emanuel asked me to stay on board with his administration, one of the very first things that we chatted about is how do we make sure that we're transforming the health of a community of almost three million people? And, and a lot of us, especially folks in the medical field, and I'm, you know, I went to medical school and I you know, spent a lot of time learning about how do you treat disease and how do you counsel patients. A lot of time we focus a lot on individual behavior. And this is extremely important. But if we're really serious about transforming the health, of, the health of a community, it's not just about individual behavior. It's more about how do we behave as a community, how do we behave as a city, um, what type of policy systems and environmental changes we need to implement in our city so we can improve the health of our community. So when, when the mayor and I had this conversation, that's when the idea of bringing together a group of community leaders, talk to our community partners, and develop a public health agenda for the city. And that's when we released Healthy Chicago. 
It was one of the um, um, achievements that the mayor wanted to do in the first 100 days of his administration. And I know many of you um, know about the mayor. And patience, I won't say, is one of the uh, best characteristics there. So within the first 100 days, we, have, we developed that agenda. We've worked with so many community partners. Um, we've talked to internal experts, local experts. Many of the folks are sitting here in the room who we counseled with, asked for advice, and we've released a public health agenda. And in that agenda, we identified 12 public health priorities. Uh, we've uh, set measurable targets that we'd want to reach for each one of those priorities between, uh, you know, that we'd want to reach by 2016 and 2020. And most importantly, we've identified almost 200 strategies, mostly focusing on policy systems and environmental change to transform the health of our, our community. So when it comes to the priorities, there's no surprise to anybody. We're talking about tobacco, we're talking about obesity, we're talking about teen pregnancy or adolescent health. Um, and then we set those, those targets, we made them very clear for better accountability. We invest almost $200 million every year into the public health system. So we wanted to make sure that the public is holding us accountable on what outcomes are we getting from those investments and we made those um, targets public. And one of those priorities was around access to care. And right around that time, a year earlier, that's when President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law. And, and for us, at first, it was how do we make sure that access to care is improved throughout the city? But very quickly, we've realized that the Affordable Care Act is a lot more than access to insurance. And, and you probably all followed the debates, followed the coverage. You know, I know, you know Steve covered it extensively on WBEZ at the time. And it was covered all over the news. And most of what you've heard about the Affordable Care Act was about insurance reform. And very, very little you've heard about anything else. So to me, when I think about the Affordable Care Act, I think of it in two buckets. There's one bucket around re insurance reforms. But then there's a huge bucket around health system redesign. And to me, this is really where the opportunity is that hasn't gotten enough attention. So what I'm going to cover for the next hour or so is really how are these two buckets impacting our work as a local health department and how are we trying to maximize the benefits of the Affordable Care Act locally when it comes to these two buckets. So I'm going to start by talking about insurance reform and really access, increasing access to coverage. So when we started thinking about this, we knew that there are around 500,000 people in our city who are, who are uninsured. So we needed to know more information about these folks. Who are they? Where do they live? What kind of characteristics do we know about them? So we partnered with an organization that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with called Health and Disabilities Advocates. And we worked with them and we issued a report that we called at the time Enroll Chicago. We issued this report back in the summer that gave us a snapshot of where the 500,000 uninsured people are in our city. And we started asking ourselves more, um, you know, the questions as to how can we be of help as a local health department to make sure that these folks have access to the right information to enroll in insurance. You know, the Affordable Care Act made very clear, you know, roles and responsibilities for state government, you know, for navigators, community partners that will be hiring navigators and enrolling people. And it says very little about the role of local government on enrolling residents. And we knew that there's a role that we could play. So we tried to figure out what can we play as a role that's effective um, in enrolling residents. Um, you know, when, when we looked at the map, we know there's around 506,000 who are uninsured. We looked at income levels. We know where they live by community. And the darker the color, the more likely that community has uninsured folks. And we implemented some of our, um, you know, the, the um, formulas as to who gets subsidy, who gets insurance exchanges, who gets, you know, who gets Medicaid expansion. And if you think about it, the way the Affordable Care Act was going to cover more people is through two main buckets. One bucket is through expanding Medicaid, and the other bucket is through uh, creating the marketplaces. Um, if you make less than 138% of the federal poverty limit, you'll automatically be in the expanded Medicaid uh, bucket. If you make anywhere between 138% of the federal poverty limit and more, you're going to be in the marketplace, but you will get subsidy 
all the way even if you make up to 400 percent of the federal poverty limit, you'll get some subsidy to purchasing your, um, your insurance. So when we looked at those numbers, 506,000 are uninsured, and if we look at the income eligibility, almost half of these folks um, well, a little bit less, you know, almost half will get the Medicaid, uh, will be Medicaid eligible, and a little bit less than half will get into the marketplace with tax subsidy. So we said, okay, we needed to know more. Who are these uninsured, and what do we know about them? So we also know that, um, you know, out of our uninsured, there's 33,415 folks who are disabled in our city who are uninsured. We know that there are 145,000 SNAP recipients who are uninsured, 7,288 seniors who are uninsured. We even have 40,161 children and youth who are uninsured, knowing very well that in the state of Illinois, you qualify for Medicaid irrespective of your documentation status. So we knew that we have an opportunity here irrespective of the Affordable Care Act. But we also know that there is 108,000 people who are undocumented. So that process helped us narrow down how do we need to focus our resources, how do we work with state government, how do we work with over 40 partner organizations that got uh, funding to hire navigators and enroll folks. Um, so we started also looking at, you know, where are these undocumented live? How can we make sure that we're, um, you know, how do we make sure that the undocumented really continue to have access to services? And we asked ourselves the questions, if the Affordable Care Act is excluding undocumented, is it really going far enough when it comes to reform? Um, and the answer, I think, you know, un the Affordable Care Act is not going enough until there is coverage, there's some type of solution for immigration, and there is immigration reform. But what we know from the Affordable Care Act is there is additional funding that is going to the community health centers or federally qualified health centers that are providing a lot of services for those who are undocumented. So we wanted to see where these, where these federally qualified health centers are, and you'll see them here on the maps, and we know that they are providing a lot of services to uninsured but also undocumented. And if you look at the number of people who these federally qualified health centers are serving, almost half a million residents in our city are receiving services through federally qualified health centers. I think there are plenty of those around here, you know, Access, Chicago Family, Circle Family, I know near North is now on the south side, and other places that are providing services for those who are uninsured but also undocumented. So we got back to the question, what can we do as a local government? You know, we don't have, we don't qualify to getting money for navigators, but we know that as a city, government and through a bunch of agencies, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people who interface with their local government on a day-to-day -day basis. So can we leverage this opportunity to reach out to those who are undocumented, to those who are uninsured and make sure they have the right information to get insured? And that's when Mayor Emanuel asked all of the city agencies to work with us to try to figure out what can we do. So we started talking to all these folks. We Doc, we know that there's a Chicago Housing Authority where 55,000 residents depend on us for housing. Uh, the Chicago Family and Support Services, that ha they have multiple city centers throughout, community centers throughout the city to provide services to seniors and other people who need assistance. Uh, we know libraries are all over the city and people interface with our libraries on a regular basis. So that's when we released our Enroll Chicago initiative. And through that initiative, we wanted to literally capitalize on those opportunities where residents are interacting with us as city government. So this is one example. Um, you know, I'm going to start by talking about artists. We know that artists' insurance rates is much higher than the rest of the population. You know, I think from a study from 2013, 43% of artists don't have insurance as compared to the 20% or so of, of the general population. And when we ask them why they're uninsured, the overwhelming majority say simply we can't afford it. So, so knowing that now they have an opportunity to enroll either in expanded Medicaid or in the marketplaces, we've worked with the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. Um, and we hosted an event specifically targeted to artists. And in our very first event, we had over 125 artists who started the enrollment process. Simply, they had no idea what the Affordable Care Act is all about. It took me a long time to understand a lot of the details of the Affordable Care Act. So it was great to bring in our partners who have the navigators and place these navigators face to face with the artists and make sure that our artists starting to get um, enrolled in insurance. 
The other thing that we know is libraries. There are over 108 librarians who we already trained throughout the system to make sure that they have some basic information so when our residents are interfacing with the librarians, they have the right answers. They can connect them to the right um, information. And, and now we've hosted a series of those uh, trainings. And now librarians, if you interface with the library system, will be able to connect residents who are uninsured for services that they need. The other, cover, the other story that I'm, um, I'm very excited about is actually our work with taxi drivers. And, and when you think about it, from a study that was done in 2011, we know that 70% of taxi drivers in Chicago are uninsured. 70% compared to the 20% of the general population. We also know there are around 12,000 taxi drivers in the city, so that gives you over 8,000 uh, taxi drivers who would qualify for insurance because they're all, you know, have some type of documentation status or are US uh, citizens, so they do qualify for the Affordable Care Act. And we also know that every day, over 300 taxi drivers come to the Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Building at the city to either renew or update their license. 300 every day, and it takes on average an hour and a half to two hours. So we started an initiative where we had navigators placed at that building where they're interfacing with taxi drivers and talking to them about their opportunities. And this is, to me, is extremely important for so many different reasons. One, over 8,000 um, um, taxi drivers would be you know, eligible to apply. They'll have the right information. But the other piece that's more important, taxi drivers in a lot of these communities, many of them are immigrants, are really the gateway to come into these communities that might not necessarily interface the best way with our you know, US-made healthcare system. So by engaging taxi drivers, you're not just engaging them and their, their families. You're also engaging their friends, their neighbors, community members that we might not be able to reach very uh, easily. This actually, this initiative has gotten tons of coverage. It was on um, the morning edition on NPR yesterday. It got coverage on the Associated Press and others. And we've been very successful in enrolling uh, taxi drivers. We started by saying, oh, we'll probably be there a couple of days a week, see how it goes. And now we've been there five days a week, every day of the week. And we're going to continue to be there all the way until um, the end of March. You know, the other group that we thought we could uh, make a difference in is really the young and the invincibles. You know, this is the group that our Affordable Care Act really heavily, heavily depends on to make sure that they are getting enrolled. That's the young and the healthy. And we know that City Colleges is around 120,000 of those students, and a large number of them are uninsured. So we partnered with Enroll America, and now we have navigators placed at these, every one of these um, uh, City Colleges um, to make sure that these students are getting the right information. And in many instances, actually, and in, in a lot of instances, we're enrolling students right, um, right on, um, on site. The other group I want to spend some time talking about are kids. And you know, I mentioned earlier that, that in Illinois, we're one of the lucky states that as a child, you will qualify for Medicaid irrespective of your documentation status if your family, you live in a family that makes 300% or lower than the federal poverty limit. But from our report, what we've noticed is there are a lot of kids in Chicago, you know, almost, you know, that's almost 40,000 or over 40,000 who are uninsured. And when we looked at their, um, at their income level, almost 20,000 are making less than, they come from families making less than 138% of the federal poverty limit. These are kids who qualify today, well, they qualified years and years ago for Medicaid and they didn't have Medicaid insurance. So can we make a difference there? What can we do there? And keep in mind that another city agency that we work very, very closely with is the Chicago Public Schools. And we know these kids, we know what schools they go to, we know if they have Medicaid or not because we compare our list of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch to the list of kids who have Medicaid and we can literally figure out school by school, by kid, by student, those students who don't have insurance. So we invested some money um, to actually launch this initiative to identify those kids and work with them to get them enrolled. Most of these kids will qualify for 
uh, traditional Medicaid, uh, but some might qualify for some other options um, through the Affordable Care Act. And we, um, you know, through this, um, um, this initiative where the city is investing uh, a bunch of money, we were able to get Atlantic Philanthropies to join us in that investment. And we're, uh, we, ident we put out a request for proposal, and we're partnering with LISC um, um, as a community partner to identify those communities with the highest rates of lack of insurance for kids and target those interventions for students in their communities with their families. And the opportunities there is not just the kids, it's also their parents now. So when we're talking to get the parents to enroll their kids in Medicaid, it's a great opportunity to enroll their parents in other options that they might have through the Affordable Care Act. So we're really excited about, um, about this, um, this project. So you might ask yourself, where are we right now? I mean, this has been um, you know, a progress for now over a year, because if you remember last year, um, Cook County was able to receive a waiver to start enrolling people in expanded Medicaid as of 2013 instead of waiting to 2014. So in, in theory, we have an advantage, or in, in, you know, in reality, as a city and as a county, we have an advantage over the rest of the country because we started enrolling people in expanded Medicaid, or we called it county care last year, as of last year. So you might ask yourself, where are we? And the numbers that I'm going to share with you, um, they're not official yet. They're not the most updated. But I wanted to share them with you anyway to give you a snapshot of where we are. When you look at Medicaid, we have around 151,000 um, enrolled statewide, which is a good number. It's not the 200,000 that we think will qualify in Chicago alone, but it's a definitely step in the right direction. Um, we know that through county care, there, was, um, there are 74,000 applications that's already approved. I know that there are um, you know, over 120,000 applications that were submitted, so there's a huge backlog there, and I know that the state is working, um, is working on that. But we know there's 70% of the county care um, 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 enrollees are from Chicago, and we're really excited about that. And we've made an effort last year to make sure that our residents are benefiting from that approach. Um, we also know that 36,000 uh, were enrolled through the SNAP Express enrollment because we know that SNAP recipients will qualify um, anyway, and there are 41,000 uh, who applied through the regular traditional process. Uh, these are the latest that I have. I don't know how, you know, how there probably are more updated numbers, uh, but as of a few weeks ago, we had 88,602 residents throughout the state who enrolled in the marketplaces. And if you look at it, the overwhelming majority of those were qualifying for financial assistance. And if you look at the different level of coverage that they're getting, there's a lot of those are getting, you know, the silver, which is kind of the middle of the pack package that they could um, that they could see. So. So we've seen some good progress. I'm excited. I'm hopeful. I think it's going to um, take us a while to get to the 97, 98% that we'd like to see. Um, you know, we know from Massachusetts it took them a couple of years to get to where they are and, and their coverage, and it's going to take us a while here as well. But we're really hopeful that the, even though that the timeline or the deadline for the marketplace ends at the end of March for Medicaid expansion, which is the population that we really are interested in making sure they have access to insurance right now, we have year long to kind of continue to enroll um, these folks. So the, the second bucket of the Affordable Care Act I'm going to spend some time on talking about, and, and again, you probably have heard I looked at the great list of speakers who participated in this, in this coverage in the series of seminars, and it looks like you got great, um, great uh, presentations on different topics. But I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the health system redesign aspects of the Affordable Care Act. And I'm going to, you know, th there are three areas of focus. I'm going to only focus on the first two. Um, you know, the state does a lot of the work around the workforce and infrastructure. We don't do a lot of that as a city government, but I'm going to be talking about the first top two. Um, there's a clear focus in the Affordable Care Act, and actually for one of the very, very first time on, a, on, on public health and prevention. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the Affordable Care Act included. How many of you have heard of the National Prevention Strategy? 
just a few. So this was a significant aspect of the Affordable Care Act that called on the development of a national prevention strategy um, for our country. And it also to make it, um, you know, to make the implementation of the strategy easier and actually the development of the strategy, the Affordable Care Act called on the creation of a national prevention council that included cabinet members from across the federal government that was chaired by the Surgeon General. It's still there, it's still up and running to actually develop that strategy and implement that strategy. And that prevention strategy put some guiding principles. Um, that's how that, that national prevention strategy looks like. So when, when the mayor and I were talking about Healthy Chicago, the way we looked at Healthy Chicago was really is our local version to implementing the national prevention strategy. And we developed them kind of similarly at the same timeline. The prevention strategy was released in, I think, June of 2011. And we've released our local version or Healthy Chicago in August of 2011. So our Healthy Chicago agenda is the local version of the National Prevention Strategy. The mayor asked every city agency head, you know, over 15 or so of the city agencies to create the interagency council for the implementation of Healthy Chicago. And we've set guiding principles for all these agencies to see how they can participate in making our city a healthier city. Um, so when, when you look more in depth about this public health and prevention focus, it has implications for physicians, but also it has a lot of implications uh, for the public health system or local government. Um, you know, for physicians, the, that aspect of the Affordable Care Act talked a lot about integrated services, talked a lot about uh, workforce development, whether it's primary care workforce, um, it put a lot of money in the National Health Service Corps, so we make sure that um, you know, our students are ending up going into primary care, going back to work in um, low-income community, urban communities, rural communities. It put a lot of money to expand federally qualified health centers. We've mentioned that a little bit earlier. So there is a lot of implications for physicians. But for, for people in public health, we've seen a significant investment in working around uh, key public health efforts focusing on policy systems and environmental change. And this is, was one of the very first significant investment into the public health system in general in our country, where, that affordable, where the Affordable Care Act put aside $15 billion for the first 10 years to invest into these policy systems and environmental changes. Um, it also put a lot of investment in chronic disease prevention, a lot of investment in epidemiology and core public health function, and the expansion of the federally qualified health centers, who we've seen as really partners in making the health of our communities uh, better. So when you, um, you know, when you look at, this is one of my favorite, uh, um, you know, um, graphs, and it shows how the $15 billion were supposed to be spent in the first 10 years between FY10 and FY19, and then after that it goes $2 billion per year. Uh, but a lot of our friends in Congress um, um, like to call this fund as a slush fund, and they keep cutting it year after year. And uh, right now, the, the, really, there's a significant cut to that fund, but at least it's still, um, it's still there. And what that fund provides, service, uh, provides dollars for is clinical prevention, community prevention, workforce and infrastructure, and research and tracking. So I'm going to give you a snapshot of how we're using some of these dollars here in Chicago. So out of that bucket, we, you know, Chicago were able to receive over $40 million dollars um, and funding from this very specific bucket to do different types of uh, prevention and public health activities uh, over the last couple of years. Um, there's a lot of systems improvement around immunization, especially around HPV immunization. The department was just, you know, a few months ago, we've received a significant amount of dollars. We were one of 12 awardees in the country to really work with the healthcare system to make sure that providers and physicians have the right decision support tools in the exam room rooms to enhance and improve our HPV vaccination records. Um, there's a lot of work around lab capacity. Uh, we've gotten a lot of funding over the last few years around obesity prevention, tobacco prevention. Um, and then we know that the, many of our partners here in the system, um, you know, like Erie Family Health Center, uh, received a uh, residency teaching grant in partnership with Northwestern University. And, and now they have a family medicine residency training program at Erie Health Center, which is a federally qualified health center's training physicians to be primary care docs. 
um, in our community. And I, um, as I looked uh, through the list of the seminar speakers, I saw that uh, my really good friend uh, Romana was a speaker here last week talking about uh, PCORI, who um, she's now you know, one of the leaders at PCORI, which is a, a dedicated fund to really focus on um, um, a lot of the um, uh, clinical interventions, a lot of the um, system redesign interventions and, and transformative design interventions, and she's leading that effort. So I won't be spending a lot of time, but I'll be mentioning some of the grants that, that Chicago has gotten uh, from that pool of money. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the policy changes that we were able to make as a city because of those funds that we've received. And most of this, these funds came you know, around the policy and systems change came directly to the health department. So I'm going to start by talking about uh, flavored tobacco sales. Um, you know, when, when you think about flavored tobacco, specifically menthol, what we think about very quickly and what we know from research is that these flavored tobacco products, specifically menthol, are proven starter products for youth. We know that. We know that they are proven starter product for youth. We know that, um, you know, out of, uh, um, we know that over 70% of black youth who smoke, smoke menthol cigarettes. We know that over 70% of LGBT youth who smoke, smoke menthol cigarettes. We know that 50% of Hispanic youth who smoke, smoke menthol cigarettes. So we know that the tobacco industry, or big tobacco, has been very clever in, in identifying targets and really get them addicted to these products. And then we also know that 90% of adult smokers started smoking as kids. So to me, it's a no-brainer. What do we really need to do to prevent kids from picking up that very, very first cigarette? And since we know that flavored tobacco products are that proven starter products, we needed to do something about that. So the mayor asked the Board of Health back this past summer to host community town hall meetings to get input from the community as to what can we do about flavored tobacco. And we hosted four of these town hall meetings that culminated in a significant report talking about flavored tobacco, specifically about menthol cigarettes with over 25 different policy recommendations and this past December Chicago became the first city in the country to restrict the sales of flavored tobacco including menthol cigarettes within 500 feet of schools because we know from research that you know the higher the density of retailers that are selling uh, cigarettes around schools the more likely kids in those schools will be experimenting with cigarettes so we're really happy about this um, this ordinance it'll be in effect starting June but we're really excited about this very groundbreaking uh, policy uh, around to flavored tobacco in the city of Chicago the other thing we've leveraged some of these ACA dollars is to create more and more smoke-free environments. Um, you know, we know that um, you know you can't smoke within 15 feet of a main entrance of, of a building. You can't smoke at work. But there are a lot more that we can take this to the next level. Can we talk about smoke-free or tobacco-free campus policies? And we worked with many institutions, including the city co the city colleges, to cr make all of their campuses, including parking lots, including their um, you know their you know their little parks and all of that to make them tobacco free and and city that policy change with city colleges impacted the lives of 120,000 students who could now learn in a tobacco-free environment, um, and also 6,000 staff and faculty. Um, so last year, we've worked with the University of Illinois, that the, the Chicago campus, that became smoke-free. We've also worked with hospital systems who were not smoke-free campus, or did not have smoke-free or tobacco-free campus policies to make a difference. So we've continued, continued to work with organizations to improve and expand the environments that are smoke-free free or tobacco free in our city. We've also worked with the Public Housing Authority. So if you think about it, 55,000 residents depend on us for residency, to live, for, for housing. So we said those residents, we want them to have the, to, the ability to make a choice to live in a tobacco free environment. And now many of our, tobacco, many of our Chicago housing authorities have you know, the, the tobacco free or smoking free policies where even inside your apartments you can't smoke because we know that you know, with all the shared air, we know that, that the, with the circulation that if you smoke in one apartment, you're really being exposed to, to secondhand smoke in the next door apartment. So a lot of progress. These are all the partners that we worked with over the last year or so to develop more and more smoke-free campus policies, uh, smoke-free policies. And because of a very targeted, aggressive 
advertisement campaigns to encourage people to quit smoking and call the tobacco quit line. What we've seen over the last six months of 2013, the calls to the tobacco quit line, which is a free resource for our residents, has more than doubled when you compare it to the last six months of 2012. And the reason that's happening is so many different, um, you know, there's so many different reasons, but one of them is really our very aggressive tobacco campaign ads that are driving residents or smokers to quit to the tobacco quit line. And we know that 73% of the callers are either black or Hispanic. So we know we're targeting the population that needs support the most uh, when it comes to ads. When it comes to uh, obesity, we spent a lot of our um, time talking about um, access to healthy and affordable food. And we, um, you know, for the first time also, we had a comprehensive food plan for our city. It was also funded by one of these grants from the Affordable Care Act, where we worked with the Department of uh, uh, Planning and Development, as well as the Consortium to Lower Obesity in Chicago's Children, to develop a food plan for our city that addresses the food access issues and that has a key, you know, strategy. And, and all of that. We've also worked on healthy vending. So we've uh, pulled all the unhealthy items from the vending machines in the parks district. We pulled all the sugary drinks, vending machines from the Chicago public schools. But we've also pulled the unhealthy items from every one of our vending machines, the snack vending machines and the beverage vending machines in every one of our city buildings. And we've challenged the private sectors to follow those same guidelines so that employees and, and, and customers have access to healthier food when they decide to use uh, vending machines. Um, you know, the neighbor cart is probably one of my most favorite projects because it really looks at the interface between economic development and public health. And, and um, this is in partnership with Streetwise. Many of you are very familiar with Streetwise where they're identifying residents who are recently out of homelessness or residents who are recently out of jail, providing them with the right training and support to become small business owners. Great economic development project. But when you think about that small business, it's basically having kiosks selling fresh fruit and vegetables, mostly in food desert areas. And that's where that intersection between economic development and public health uh, works very well together. Last year, we had 15 of those um, up and running, mostly in low access community. This year, we're going to have 15 more. So we're going to have a total of 30 of those out in the community. Many of you are also very familiar with our urban farming, uh, urban farming policies and ordinances that we've um, changed a lot of these policies and ordinances to make it easier to do urban farming in our, um, in our city. Um, and I, I know that the mayor has been personally engaged in making sure that many of the mainstream grocers are coming up to low access communities, opening up stores, um, and that um, you know, will make definitely a significant difference. The other key strategy when it comes to obesity is our built environment. And how do we make sure that we're creating an environment that's um, suitable or that's encouraging for physical activity? And also as part of the funding for the, from the Affordable Care Act, we worked with the Department of Transportation and many partners in the community on a new um, uh, guidelines or, or the, the complete streets uh, guidelines. And the key shift in that, in that set of guidelines were really shifting the priorities for who our streets are designed for. I think when we all think about streets, the first thing we think about are cars. But the reality is everybody who's using a street is a pedestrian at one point in their commute. And if we're serious about in creating an environment where people could be more physically active, we have to prioritize pedestrians. And that's what those uh, guidelines said. Said the streets' top priorities are pedestrian, followed by public transit and, and biking, followed by cars. And there's a, you know, something that um, 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 our former transportation commissioner, my really good friend Gabe Klein would say, um, you know, his advice to people, if, you're doing, if, you, if your commute is a mile or less, you really should walk that commute. If your commute is between one mile and four miles, you really should bike to get where you're supposed to go. If your commute is between four miles to eight miles, you should use public transportation to get to where you're supposed to go. If your commute is more than eight miles, you should consider using public transportation. But if you can't get there using public transportation, you should consider using a car. And this is really that philosophy is what happened in that complete streets guidelines that we've issued um, this past year. And as a result of that, you're seeing a lot of built environment support, a lot more protected bike lanes in our city so that residents would feel more comfortable jumping on a bike 
uh, and, then dry, and then biking to where they're supposed to go. Um, the Divi bike has been a tremendous success. Uh, we had almost 800,000 trips that have been happening already, more than 1.7 miles, a million miles that have been uh, ridden. Really great, very successful program. Um, you know, we're going to continue to add more bike lanes. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many of you are on Dearborn very often. This is right in the heart of the central business district, where we took one car lane and the heart of the central business district and transformed this car lane into two-way bike lane and added the right um, um, lights and, and signage for bikers. I can't think of any other city that has the courage, honestly, to take a car lane and the heart of the central business district to make that change. So we're really happy with the progress there. The other work that we've done is really around baby-friendly hospital designation. Um, this is also very important when it comes to breastfeeding. And when we started this process, this is a WHO designation um, that allows hospitals to implement a set of policies to encourage breastfeeding for uh, moms right after they give birth at the hospitals. And, and I'm really happy to report that 15 of our 19 maternity hospitals right now are in the pathway to becoming a baby-friendly hospital and get that designation. So we're really, uh, we're really excited, um, we're really excited about, um, about that. Um, the, the other th thing that we've done is we've worked a lot with the Chicago Public School and we actually just recently received another additional funding to continue our work with CPS and if you think about it, CPS has 404 or so thousand students who go there every day. What a great opportunity for public health interventions and we spent a lot of time building the right infrastructure to be able to make a difference with CPS students. We have a chief health officer right now who has dual reporting relationship to the CPS CEO but also also to me at the health department, so we created the right infrastructure to make a difference. Um, we've changed the standards of the 59 million meals that are offered at CPS every year. Think about that, 59 million meals have now much, much better standards on the type of food that's being offered there. Uh, we've worked with CPS on um, you know, removing unhealthy snacks, we've worked with them, um, um, you know, but, but being called the, um, you know, the cupcake Nazi is not you know, something that I'm proud of during my tenure at, at the <laughs> health department. Um, we've worked on um, you know, supporting vendors who are coming to CPS schools, make sure they're selling healthier items, um, you know, we by extending the school days, and I know this has been, you know, a, 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 there's been a lot of debate on extending school days, and I used to listen to all your coverage on, on extending the school days. One huge win, one of the main reasons why I was so supportive of extending school days is the possibility of bringing recess back to school, and we did that. And just recently, the Board of Ed passed a comprehensive PE policy that brings PE back to our students. Every one of our students, every grade, this is really exciting and that really is a result of the dedicated efforts and times that we were able um, to afford because of the Affordable Care Act. So a lot of work around policies, uh, policy changes, but we've also done some work around systems changes. Um, there are a couple of examples I'm very excited about, and, and um, um, you know, one of them is our partnerships with federally qualified health centers. And how do we customize uh, their electronic health record system so physicians, when they're interfacing with our patients, have the right decision support tool to do the right thing when it comes to prevention. And I, you know, I'm a, I, you know, I practice at a federally qualified health centers, I ran a federally qualified health centers, I ran the implementation of electronic health records at a healthcare center system, and I know how important that is. So we're working with so many different partners to make sure that, you know, if your patient smokes and you ask them a few questions, we should make it so easy for our providers that, that if that patient is ready to quit smoking, that physician or that provider could, with a click of a button, send a message to the tobacco quit line, and the tobacco quit line can initiate the call to that patient who's ready to quit smoking so that we create an incentive for that person to quit smoking. We're looking at so many different uh, iteration of those approaches that we're very, very excited about. Uh, we work with many partners um, uh, to make that happen. Um, the other thing around, um, around system changes is public health accreditation, and I wanna take a minute to talk about this because it's critical. Um, you know, when I uh, moved to um, the health department, when I joined the health department, um, I didn't know, honestly, much about 
local health departments. Um, I, um, I'm curious, I always like to learn more, uh, but I very quickly realized that there is no accreditation process for local health departments. And I come from the medical system. There's JCO, there is um, you know, all kind of accreditation that we have to, uh, um, to work on. And, and right at the time when I was appointed, the CDC and the Public Health Accreditation Board created an accreditation path for uh, local health departments. And, and I took this very seriously because we want to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing when it comes to the health department. And we want to make sure that those hundreds of millions of dollars that we're spending year after year are spent based on some type of standards. And, and I'm, I'm happy to report that as of August of this past year, in 2013, we became the first big city health department and actually the only big city health department in the country that's accredited. And I'm very, very proud of that because it really tells us that our efforts and our focus is really in the right direction when it comes to systems, um, systems improvement. The other thing that was key also in the Affordable Care Act was um, requiring hospitals to do community assessments when it, uh, if they want to maintain their not-for-profit status. So we know that this was an opportunity for hospitals to be engaged beyond their, you know, their emergency department, their medicine floor, their surgical floor. So we worked with all these hospitals to try to figure out are there opportunities for partnership there? And when we compared all the community health needs assessment, and there's a report on that uh, on our website, we found that there's a huge opportunity for overlap. There's huge opportunity for leveraging a lot of the community health hospital assessments to make a difference in population health. Um, you know, we know that local hospitals spent $1.4 billion in some type of charity um, 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 investment over per year in our system, in our city. So how can we leverage those dollars to look at areas where we can find better opportunities to really improve the system? So that's an area that we've been also uh, focusing on. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about innovation because I know, um, you know, Fermana was here and Matthew was here a few weeks ago. You guys probably have heard a lot about these. So I'm going to just spend a little bit talking about how the Affordable Care Act is really pushing for innovation. And within the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, there was a creation of an innovation center. And that's really dedicated a lot of funds to push for innovation in the healthcare system at so many different levels throughout the country. I know many folks have. Uh, um, received some funding there um, to really look at different opportunities to improve the healthcare system. I think to me this is another area where there is um, a lot of opportunities for improving health outcomes is that intersection between public health and clinical medicine and the funds that are coming from the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services and Innovation are really targeted towards that um, that principle. So it's a lot of uh, excitements. There are different models that are being tested, models that are developed by policy experts. Um, there's a lot of uh, push to think about, you know, compelling approaches, not really funding the status quo, but really push the limit, redesign systems, really think differently about things. Uh, there's a lot of talk about accountable care organizations. There's a lot of talk about um, dual eligibles. There's a lot of uh, opportunities for bundled payments, tons of opportunities when it comes to um, redesigning our um, our healthcare system. Uh, I also know that there are innovation grants that are right here in Chicago. Um, there's actually a couple are right here at the University of Chicago, and we're very excited to work with uh, with the lead PIs on both of those um, innovation. Uh, at the state level, we've been working very closely with the state on the new funding that they've received last year to create this Alliance for Health to help us rethink what Medicaid pays for. What are these services that Medicaid needs to pay for, services that don't need to pay for, and really help us reimagine what Medicaid would look like. And this is um, a process that we've been heavily engaged in. The community's been engaged in. There are a lot of roundtable discussions around that. So I encourage you to be uh, part, of that, uh, part of that process as well. On the PCORI side, I'm uh, very excited actually about um, one funding opportunity that we've been integral to um, that went to the University of Illinois that's looking at at, uh, residents or kids specifically who are multiple visitors, repetitive visitors to the emergency department because of asthma. So are there opportunities to do more targeted case management for these folks? And then 
is there a role for a local health department where we have tons of inspectors that do healthy homes visits to be able to go to these families' homes, inspect the homes, and see if there are triggers that are triggering asthma for those kids in their homes and try to mitigate that risk. So this is a project that we're very happy about. It's, um, it's just got funded recently. The other project I'm very excited about is something called the Chicago Health Atlas. How many of you have heard of the Chicago Health Atlas? Okay, many of you, great. Um, so what we've done with the Chicago Health Atlas, one of the um, key strategy that the mayor's been pushing us to do is really data liberation. So if we have data sets as government agencies, let's just liberate this data, these data. We don't really, unless there's a reason why we wanna be so protective of the data, let's liberate them and make sure they're available to researchers, community partners. So what we've done last year, we've opened up tons of data sets and we created the Chicago Health Atlas um, so that residents and communities could go to these website uh, to that chicagohealthatlas.org and really learn more about their communities. And what we've done, we've worked with informaticians, um, informatics folks from different institutions, and we were able to get a dump of data of de-identified clinical data from 2006 from five major healthcare institutions, and we were able to put those data into one database that allows us access to de-identified but individual clinical data for over three million residents from Metro Chicago, and including almost a million from Chicago as a city. It's a huge opportunity for us to really reimagine what we can do with these data and because of that effort, and because of all these partners have been working together on the Chicago Health Atlas recently, um, we were able to, to apply for one of the, cap uh, one of the um, PCORI grants and receive over $7 million from PCORI to really take that Chicago Health Atlas and give it a shot of steroids and really take it to the next level. So we're really, really excited about this. So many different partners are involved. And if you think about the future of medicine, it's all gonna be about data. You know, predictive analytics is so key. If you don't know what predictive analytics is, I really encourage you to read about it. Um, you know, when I think about it, it's, you know, people in the corporate world predict what kind of soup we're gonna purchase from the grocery store if we use our loyalty card on a regular basis. So there's no reason why we don't use similar, you know, methodology to try to predict who's gonna need healthcare, who's gonna need uh, public health services, and really target our efforts um, that way. So this is um, really exciting. So there's a lot of stuff happening on the Affordable Care Act um, that really is impacting the way we behave as a local health department, but it really all boils down to the fact that if we are serious about transforming the health of our population, we really need to be thinking a lot more than just individual behavior. We really have to think about how do we behave as a city. Um, just yesterday, we've released our 2013 annual report for Healthy Chicago. I know many of you are on Twitter. I think it's the McLean, uh, McLean seminar hashtag. I just tweeted earlier today, actually scheduled it to be released right Right now probably uh, the link to the annual report so I encourage you to take a look at it and it gives you an idea of the type of work that we're doing as a city and there are all these different ways where you can uh, connect with us um, we love it when people interact with us on social media so please take a moment to follow us on uh, Twitter or follow us on uh, Facebook and I'm looking forward to the conversation thank you so much Do you feel that uh, it's a major problem still in Chicago, and does your agency have the power to shut down or deny the opening of charter schools that don't have playgrounds, athletic fields, and gyms? Because I have taught in some of those schools, and they should never have been allowed to open. Yeah, so um, the question around uh, obesity in, in children is a significant issue in the city. Um, but this is an issue that actually I'm very, very happy to report that we're turning the corner on. If you think about it, back in 2003, so short 10 years ago, one in four kids entering kindergarten to the Chicago public schools were obese. That's one in four, and those kids were obese, not overweight and obese, just obese. Um, 
10 years later, we just issued a report looking at our 2012, 2012 data that showed that now one in five kids entering kindergarten are obese. So we're making some progress. We're definitely turning the corner on pediatric obesity. Um, what that means is a 1,000 kids are entering kindergarten now at a healthier weight. So I'm happy with the progress we're making. We actually now, for the first time in ever, we have a data sharing agreement with CPS to actually get the data from um, from CPS, from their physical exam forms, and we've completed our first comprehensive obesity report back in 2012, uh, back in 2011, and we've updated the data with 2012-2013 data uh, last year. So that's how we track that right now on a regular basis. Uh, when it comes to um, um, to charter schools who don't have uh, playgrounds, my understanding, and I might be wrong, that these charter schools still have to abide by some of these policies, and, and the PE policy is very, very clear. Physical activity is back at CPS, it's back for every grade, and it's back to stay. So we want to make sure that um, uh, kids continue to have access to, uh, to PE classes. I seriously, seriously doubt we have the authority to prevent opening of these uh, charter schools. <laughs> If we do, I'll, I'll look into that. You know, I've learned, uh, um, you know, I've always thought that everything in uh, public health or in, in health is controversial until I started uh, being more involved and in following what happens in education. It's a lot more controversial there, that's for sure. Uh, I think we have microphones. I think you did a great job promoting the, the good things that your department are doing. One thing, however, that I noticed was not on your priorities list was mental health. You know, I know the city has shut down six of its 12 mental health clinics. Those people have been left with nothing, no access to mental health care practitioners they develop relationships with, nothing in their area. These are people with serious mental illness. Others who still live near the ones that, are, that remain open have been put on Medicare, I mean, I'm sorry, Medicaid, got Medicare in my mind, um, have been put on, on Medicaid, and then have been told, oh, sorry, you can't use your Medicaid at these clinics anymore. And I, you know, I'm wondering what kind of responsibility you and the city are going to take for the mental health of these seriously mentally ill patients. So the mental health question is a question I get all the time, and this is a very, very important issue to us. So if you think about it, um, you know, traditionally we've been known as the Department of Clinical Services, really not the Department of Public Health, and we've delivered primary care and mental health services for years and years. Back in 2012, or actually in 2011 when we were preparing for the 2012 budget, we've realized that it's really time to challenge the status quo and reform our own mental health system, but most importantly, enhance the mental health system throughout the city. So here's what we've done. So the first thing we've done back in 2012, we said we need to Im improve our own system. So we had 12 clinics, all poorly staffed, not enough staff in each one of these clinics that were delivering services really on a shoestring. So we said, let's consolidate these clinics from 12 to six, better staff each one of these clinics and make sure that residents who depend on us for services continue to have access to services. So that's what we've done. We've transitioned the care of 429 insured clients, those were insured residents who have insurance, we transitioned their care to the community mental health providers, we followed up with them a month later, we scheduled their appointments, we followed up with them a month later, and we followed with them 60 days later. And if they didn't like the new provider, we asked them to come back. And as a Matter of fact, out of the 429 residents who are insured who we transitioned their care, 62 came back to our system. But most importantly, what we did is we enhanced the overall mental health system throughout the city. So we said, okay, how can we improve access to psychiatric services for people throughout the community? We made available half a million dollars for community mental health providers to hire more psychiatrists. And as a result of that, more than 5,000 psychiatric visits has happened this past year alone, actually in the first three months of, of 2013. We said, okay, we know that the integration between mental health services and behavioral health and, and substance abuse is not good enough. So we invested another million dollars into community mental health providers to enhance that integration between mental health and substance abuse. Then we said we've never done any services for kids. We know kids need behavioral health services. So we've partnered with the Illinois Children's Healthcare Foundation. 
four million dollar investment into Humboldt Park and Inglewood to make sure that kids in those two neighborhoods have access to be integrated primary care and behavioral health services. And then we've worked with Thresholds and HRDI to reopen two of our former clinics to make them available for our residents. So we've enhanced the system dramatically over the last couple of years. Um, and for the folks who depended on us for services, we made sure we followed them, every one of them, we tracked every one of them, and we made sure that they follow, that they continue to receive care. Now when it comes to the, uh, today, with more and more people having access to insurance, you want to keep something very important in mind. Folks who don't have insurance have very limited options when it comes to mental health services. And if we want our mental health clinics as a city agency to start accepting private insurance, then those who don't have insurance are not going to have places to go to or enough places to go to. So we do want to continue to be the, the, the provider of last resort, especially for those who are uninsured. But keep in mind that if you're our own patient, and you have Medicaid and you continue to have Medicaid, you're most than welcome to continue to receive services with us. If you're our existing patient who become uninsured, who, are, who is uninsured, but now becomes eligible for insurance and you choose to stay with us, you're most than welcome to stay with us. But if you're a new patient who comes in through our door who has insurance, we're gonna tell you these are your options. There are so many more options for you to be able to receive services. But if you still want to come and receive services with us, we're still going to take you. So I feel like these changes we have to adapt. We cannot continue to keep the status quo. There's a, everything is changing in our system. And if we don't change as a government, and I know that everybody will tell you, oh, we love change, we love change. The reality is people love the status quo. A lot of people economic dependent, uh, you know, economic interest depends on the status quo. We cannot be a status quo department. We have to have the courage to change the system and improve the system for our residents. There's a question here. So um, the question about the, you know, the, now that more and more people will be insured, there's going to be a lot need for, for more services and the capacity might not be there. This is actually a function of the state health department. We work very closely with uh, Dr. Hasbrook and his team. They just recently issued a new report around workforce and around <coughs> services that kind of look at that, um, at that balance. Um, I, I'll be happy to share with you that report. We don't take the lead as a local health department when it comes to that. Um. You might check into the uh, Cook County Detention Center. Uh, the Chicago schools run the school in there, and a lot of those kids, about 60% or more, have mental health issues. So someone brought up the psychiatric services. Those might be enhanced there. But I did have a question on um, the food carts. Uh, are those, what area, is there a map of those that can be viewed online? Uh, not now, but uh, you know, can people look those up? And are, there's going to be 15 more. Uh, are they just in sort of the food desert areas, or are they going to be available all to all of Chicago? And I saw just saw a show on hydroponics, which can be put on roofs. They don't use soil, so the weight is much less. That might be something you could look into. Uh, th thank you for the suggestion. When it comes to um, um, to the food cart, um, they, uh, I thought I had the map here. Uh, we do have the map. The majority of these food carts are in low access communities. The majority of the new carts that are coming up will be in low access communities. And I can't tell you how important advocacy is to get these food carts to places. Um, you know, I remember um, Lauren Hughes, a, a, a medical student at Rush University, who, um, you know, heard about this, the, the food carts and figured that her patients at right on, you know, around the UIC campus are not having enough access to fresh fruit and vegetables. They can go out and eat all kind of, uh, find all kind of stores that are selling junk there. So she, lo literally, she lobbied, worked with the hospital administration, worked with Streetwise, and now she has, you know, the, the area there has a food cart. So anybody who'd be interested in lobbying for those food carts, I'll be happy to create the connections. Um, those have been amazing. I mean, I spent you know, time talking to these vendors, and it's just, it's an amazing transformation stories for them individually, but most importantly to me also is the access to healthy and affordable food. Uh, but if you can email me or figure out, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to share with you the map. You have a question there? And I think uh, there's somebody here who would be next. 
Any possibility you could frame the trauma center desert issue on the south side as a city of Chicago Department of Public Health issue that you could devote some resources to? Um, the, the trauma center issue is actually beyond our jurisdiction. We don't have the, you know, the capacity or the, you know, or the internal uh, talent to be involved in this. I know it's a state issue. Um, I know this issue keeps coming up um, on a regular basis, but we'll be happy to be involved peripherally, but really it's a state, um, state level issue. I have a question on the flip side of access, and that is when we looked at the number of the health insurance plans, the bronze and the silver, there is often a significant amount of coinsurance that a person has to pick up, or in some cases you can find a list even like Northwestern University of Chicago. Insurance plans are not even accepted. So is there a concern that you'll see things that are positive on paper, but in reality actually mean that the person has in theory, insurance, but it's essentially useless. Yeah, so you, you bring in a very, very important question. And um, you, you know, when you think about it, um, there are a couple of good, really good things about just having access to insurance, period, irrespective of what your deductible is or what your copay is, is the fact that preventive measures have to be covered at no cost um, to residents, to, to those who are insured. So this morning, actually, right before coming here, I was at the Breast Health Summit in Roseland, and, and one of the key challenges for women to getting mammography services, even those who are insured, was all along to have to pay copay to get a mammogram, copay to get a, a physician's visit, and then have to meet their deductible. So this has been a, a huge barrier for, pe for women to getting mammography services. So what we know from the Affordable Care Act, all these preventative measures have to be covered, no cost, no copay, not part of your deductible. So that aspect I'm very, very excited about. But the, on the flip side is what you mentioned, is what happens when now you have to meet a deductible of 1000 bucks or 1500 bucks? What happens when you, know, you have to receive those services, but you have to come up with all these out-of-pocket money? And this is a conversation that I'm directly involved in with federally qualified health centers. So if you remember, also in 2012, we partnered with federally qualified health centers, and we transitioned the care of our own clinics to these federally qualified health centers and we support federally qualified health centers to deliver services in those clinics. And these CEOs are telling me, even when people have insurance, they might prefer to pay the, the sliding scale rather than having to pay the copay and then meet their deductible and all of that. In reality, I don't know what the future is going to look like. I think we're going to learn this year. We're going to learn more next year. But we'll keep an eye on how what that, uh, the impact would be. But very, very good question. Picking up a little bit on uh, your discussion of HPV, the, uh, uh, I've been talking to other practitioners and we're not sure if the, the Gardasil uh, vaccine is with zero copays in most situations. And then a, a related one, you, you probably have seen research that suggests that uh, in black women, uh, the coverage of the current Gardasil for oncogenic uh, HPV strains is, is less reliable. Um, can you um, address both angles of that? Yeah, so um, um, there are a couple of things that we're working on, um, um, on the HPV piece. Our immunization team was very lucky to actually have received this grant. I think our focus right now has been mostly on improving systems. So there are um, you know, decision support tools for providers to be able to order and, and get girls and boys their HPV vaccine. We're making some vaccines available for federally qualified health centers. So for those who are uninsured and those who um, you know, are underinsured, they would be able to have access to um, HPV vaccine. So I think the, the access piece should be resolved or at least should be addressed in one way, shape, or form. I'll be happy to follow up with you separately on, on the access piece. Um, on the black women um, um, uh, coverage, I'm not the right person to chat about this. Dr. Julie Morita will be the right person, and I'll be happy to connect you with her. She's our medical director uh, for immunization. Uh, but I know this is on her radar. She's mentioned it to me, but I don't know all the details. Is, is there a copay under the Affordable Care Act for receiving the vaccine? I don't think so. It's part of the preventative measures, but, uh, but I'll, I'll can, I can double check on that. The mentions of breast cancer and obesity uh, brought to mind the significant health disparities that exist uh, within the city of Chicago and surrounding communities. I'm curious to know what progress is being made to close those disparities and what impact the expansion of health insurance under ACA will really have on the ability of the public health sector to, to drive those disparities close. So the disparities issues is an extremely important issue. And, and what we've, um, you know, this morning, for example, at the, at the Breast Health Summit, um, you know, when you think about it, 
black women are slightly less likely than white women to getting breast cancer, but in Chicago, they're one and a half times more likely to die from breast cancer. If you look at Roseland and you know the three communities around it, Beverly, Washington Park, and, and not Was yeah, but Beverly, Washington Heights, and, and uh, uh, Auburn Gresham, they have the top four highest rates of premature death from breast cancer. So for, on this issue specifically, the reason why we have disparities is really three reasons. One, we want to make sure that more and more black women are getting screened. We want to make sure that these black women are getting screened with high quality mammograms and not just the analog machines, but also digital machines and good appropriate radiologists reading the reports. And you want to shrink the time it takes when you diagnose a black woman with breast cancer. You want to shrink that time between she's diagnosed and she's linked to care. So on this specific issue, our approach has been, how can we resolve these three pieces and can we close the disparities gap by working on this? So you know, I had that same exact conversation with the mayor a few months ago and as a result of that we've invested two hundred thousand dollars with Roseland Community Hospital to expand access to 1,500 women to get access to mammography services, so the screening piece. We know that Roseland Hospital was able to secure a grant to get an upscale digital mammography machine, so it's not the good old analog machine. And we know that they're working with the Metropolitan Breast Cancer Task Force to have navigators on site, so when they diagnose a woman with breast cancer, this woman is linked directly into care. So for each one of these disparities, there's a different approach that we're taking. And if you look at Healthy Chicago and the strategies that we've developed, they were really developed with that lens in mind. How do you close this parity's gap? So that's really, the way I look at Healthy Chicago is really our most aggressive assault as a city on disparities. And we're starting to see some moving the needle on those disparities, but it takes a time to move the needle on those disparities. And keep in mind, you know, I, I think to really make a difference on disparities, all these public health interventions are nice and dandy, but unless we go to the basic social determinants of health, we empower people to get better education, we empower people to get out of poverty, we empower people to get better jobs, until we work on these social determinants of health, all of our equity work is not going to be good enough to be able to close disparities gap. But those metrics that we track really look directly into disparities issues. Um, going back to the produce charts, I I think that's such an exciting program, and I was wondering if you're looking at more ways to further economic and workforce development through public health initiatives. Um, the, the short answer to this is no, unfortunately. The, you know, we work as close as we can with the Department of Planning and, and Deve Economic Development in the city. Um, this was, you know, it took a long time to get this project up and running. And I, I don't know about you, but this is my first government job and I'm realizing very, I've realized very quickly that things don't happen very easily and you have to be, you know, very patient on getting things done. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any specific workforce development project that ties in directly into public health. I know there are a few state level initiatives. I know there's a community health worker bill right now in, the, um, in, the, um, in Springfield that's kind of making its way that would eventually create a new group of, you know, legitimize a good, really hard working group of public health workers in our communities. Uh, but I don't think we're directly involved in anything else at this point. So I'll ask you a, a local question, Commissioner. Uh, so here, like one of your last slides, you had public health and medical care and the integration. So here at the University of Chicago, there's been a lot of talk now about doing population health management. So moving ahead, what do you see as some of the most promising ways that the Department of Public Health might collaborate with the University of Chicago looking at our catchment area and population. Yeah, and, and this is this is actually one of the areas that I'm most excited about in public health. And and um, you know when, when people ask me why you've been there for four years, this is your fifth year, why are you still there? And I you know my question is there are two areas in public health that are extremely exciting right now. It's that intersection between public health and economic development and we're doing a lot of work with LISC and the LISC communities and, and the new communities programs and others and I you know I've had multiple roundtable discussions with folks at Wood lawn and other areas. So I feel like that intersection is extremely interesting. And I think the other part is the intersection between public health and, and clinical medicine. So we're working on different
different projects right now. I know at the University of Chicago, we work with you very closely on the diabetes translational research project to build the right infrastructure so that we have better surveillance for diabetes that we could be of support to academicians, but also to the community. Uh, with Northwestern, we're working on a, a Keep Your Heart Healthy project where we are in two communities in North Lawndale and in Humboldt Park on trying to identify individuals at high risk for cardiovascular disease and link them to care. This is um, funded by the GE Foundation and it started as a pilot program. Very soon we're going to announce a significant expansion um, to this funding opportunities and expanding to more communities. Our work with the University of Illinois around um, asthma, repetitive asthma visitors to the emergency department is another example. Uh, we're now piloting a project with Rush around using technology to be able to connect uh, what kids are eating in schools and can we use that as a way to make sure that we're be changing behavior. So I think there are a lot of opportunities with hospital systems, with the community health needs assessments that hospital has to do. There are a lot of opportunities there. Um, I know healthcare systems have to be part of or will be part of accountable care entities and those entities have to be looking into population health very clearly. So there's tons and tons of opportunities. The challenge is how do we have the bandwidth to do this type of work. So at, from the department side, we built the infrastructure specifically for that. So we have now um, a chief innovation and strategy officer, who you know, Dr. Jay Bott, who's working specifically on this area to see how we can leverage those relationships. Dr. Julie nowinski konchak who joined the department, also leading that type of effort. Dr. Arlene Hankinson, who's joined the department to look into how those intersections can get better. So far, to be honest with you, we've been very pragmatic when we see opportunities, we see funding opportunities, we have the right partners, we jump in. That's why these types of conversations are very helpful to build those type of connections and when opportunities come up, we apply for funding. Your talk was uh, wonderful. Uh, you talked for an hour with a wealth of information and I didn't count one single breath and that's, that's not healthy. But thank you, thank you very much for a great talk. Thank you. I do run every morning, so for I get plenty of breaths running. I did five miles this morning, so I'm I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> um, are we good? And, uh, big big hand for Dr. Shakir. Thank you so much for having me.